Oh, it's temporal. It's here today and gone tomorrow. All right. If you have your Bibles, will you turn with me, please, to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 3. <coughs> Second Timothy chapter number three and verse one. Second Timothy three one says, Now this also, know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy without natural affection, truce-breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Bless this holy book now, Father. In thy name I pray, amen. The Apostle Paul time and again gives us warnings and tries to tell us what the age is going to be like that we're living in. I certainly believe that 2015 fits the bill here. I believe that's a good description of the kind of world that you're going to go out into when you leave this building today. You're going to go right out into a cultural hellhole. The culture in America is a festering sewer. And you're going to go out into it and you're going, to be, uh, you're going to be confronted and assaulted way, by wave after wave of uh, paganism and uh, barbarism and ignorance because that uh, permeates our culture today. Just a few days ago, you watched a, or heard about a monster, a coward, they are all cowards, go into a college out there in uh, Oregon and walked into a classroom. He was armed and they weren't. They were in a... They were in a gun-free zone. What you need to do is to mark through gun-free zone and just put underneath it, sitting duck. Because that's exactly what it means. Uh, folks, it's illegal to murder people. So if a man's going to murder you, do you think he's going to pay any attention to a gun-free zone? But in any event, this, this monster went in there and he began to go from one to the next and, 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 and with cold blood murdered them. It's obvious that he had no compassion toward any of them. He showed no mercy and he gunned them down one by one. But what's so very interesting to this preacher is the fact that as he had them all sit on the floor and then he went to one and said, would you stand up uh, if you're a Christian? And this individual stood up. And so the first one that stood up, he looked at and said, All right, you're a Christian. Well, so you're going to see your God real soon, just in the next few seconds or something of that nature. And then shot them dead on the spot, showing no mercy and no compassion whatsoever. But now it gets very interesting because he goes to the second one. And that individual is obviously fully aware of what has just happened to the first one. And says, if you're a Christian, stand up. And they stood up. That, my friend, is the brightest shining light in Christianity. It doesn't get any better than that genuine martyr for the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. That took enormous courage. That took the grace of God. That individual had already seen him murder one and knew they were going to die. But they loved their Lord Jesus Christ more than they did their own life. Amen. I'm looking forward to the day when I come face to face and meet that individual. I want to shake their hand and let them know that how much that kind of a testimony inspires me. Now you go out through the nation and the, and the mainstream media, of course, played upon it. Our illustrious president marched out and the first thing he had to say was he wanted to add more gun control. He wasn't one bit interested in who had been shot to death. And then the word began to get out that he had targeted Christians, which of course is, and I have no use for hate crimes and hate speech. That's a bunch of garbage created to shut you up and take your First Amendment right away from you. But then they begin to talk about a hate crime. 
which when, when it becomes a hate crime, then it immediately brings the federal government into it, yeah. FBI and the rest of them. And so they started talking about it being a hate crime, and it began to get out across the nation that, that he had targeted, he had targeted, asked people about their religion. And newspapers, the paper of record, the New York Times, prints all the news that's fit to print. It printed about this story, and the only thing it said was that he was asking them about their religion. And most of the mainstream media simply looked at it from that direction. But then here and there it began to come out. It took a while that he was targeting Christians. That changed it entirely. And now you have a specific faith that he's going after. Not just religion. He's going after Christians. And my friend, that's when I really started taking note. Because I wanted to hear what was going on. I think it had been two days after this had happened before it finally came out that he was targeting Christians because they were interviewing witnesses that were in the building and had seen and heard what had happened. And so they got a first-hand account about how he had targeted Christians. I began to notice how that the, that the anti-gun agenda that is uh, propagated by our, the fellow up there at 1600 uh, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue began to shut down. I noticed how that they had begun to back off. I noticed how at first they were calling for new gun legislation and new and new and new laws against guns and so forth. But I noticed how they started quieting down. And then I thought to myself, I know why they're quieting down. They're quieting down because this is about the killing of Christians. It's about the murder of Christians and the American people aren't stupid. They know that's what it's about. It's not about guns. It's about a murderer about a demon-possessed monster that walked into that building that morning and he blew these people away because he hated Christians. And I'd like to know how he was raised. I'd like to know something about his mom and his dad and the home that he came from. I'd like to know what they let him watch. I'd like to know what they let him read. I'd like to know what kind of music he listened to. I'd like to know what this guy had been feasting on all of his life that got him to that situation. He didn't get that way overnight, folks. When you begin to build up a hatred for Christians, there's got to be some kind of a satanic motive for it. There's got to be some kind of a sinister spirit that's involved in the thing. And I certainly, for one, would like to know. Now, make no mistake. We've got some good Christian people out there that are good diggers, man. I'm telling you right now, they are, they are what do you call that reporter that gets out in a investigative reporter? They're investigative reporters. They'll find out. They'll find out where he came from. They'll find out about his dad and his mom. You say, well, his mom and dad didn't have anything to do with it. They had a lot to do with it. The situation today in America didn't happen overnight. It's the way you're raised that has an awful lot to do with the way you're going to turn out. The Bible said raise up a child in the way he should go. And when he gets old, he'll not depart from it. Oh, yes. His mom and his dad had a lot to do with it. I've heard, first reports I've heard is that he was a mama's boy. And that uh, therefore he held on to her coattails and so forth and so on. I don't know, to, you know, I don't know a, a lot of this, a, a lot of what's going on. But I'll tell you what now, I'll tell you what, it's, it's good for a boy to get him out and let him get dirty. It's good for a boy to take him out and show him what it is to hunt. It's a good for a boy to take him out and, and teach him what it is to be a male and not a female. America's destroying the gender identity of these young men and they're turning them into it's. Well, you don't even know what you're looking at anymore. You don't know what you, you know, I used to know the difference and anymore. I don't know what I'm talking to half the time. That's sad, folks. That's sad. Over here at the great University of Tennessee, they're, uh, they're changing the gender uh, he and she to what was it? There's a new one out. I forget now what it is. They're, they've got a new term where it's, it's, it's gender neutral. They don't want to offend anybody. You know, I get so sick of hearing people talking about not want to offend anybody. When the Supreme Court voted on what they voted the other day, they offended me. Every time I see two men holding hands, I'm offended. When I see two men kissing each other, I'm highly offended. And yet, my friend, I don't count because I'm a Christian. I hope you understand today, folks. That this new, the news media and then the movers and the shakers of this culture are anti-Christ and they're coming against you and your faith and they're going to ram it down your throat 
all my friend saying they don't want to offend anybody. That's what's called political correctness. But he said this statement. This murderer said that he would be welcomed in hell and embraced by the devil. And I thought to myself, my goodness gracious, he probably believed that. He probably believed that he was going to go down to hell and have one big party from now on. But the Bible says that hell is the place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You need to understand that Americans are ignorant and they're pagan. They're superstitious and they are barbaric. You've got to understand this country is going is going quickly down the drain and it's losing any identity that it had had one time with Christians. It's losing it quickly. You need to understand that the culture that you're part of today is against your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when I look at this, I think to myself, my, 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 my. How could the two extremes be any more? On one hand, you've got a murdering, demon-possessed coward that walks in there and kills these people. All it would have taken is one little 19-year-old girl with a 9 millimeter, and she'd have sent him to his maker in a heartbeat in that gun-free zone. Oh, yeah. That did, a 22, a long rifle aimed correctly would have taken care of the job. Sent him out to meet his maker. You better believe it. In plain words, if any of those kids had been armed, he might have gotten one. He might even have gotten two, but somebody would have shot him dead before he killed nine people. That's a fact. You can argue gun control all you want to. That is a fact. It's like that sheriff up there in Milwaukee that I heard the other night say that sheriff looked into the camera and says, the fellow at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue has got an army protecting him, and rightfully so. He's the president, and he's got the Secret Service and all these armed men around him uh, taking care of him, but they want to take you and put you out there like a sitting duck and where they care nothing about your life and just let them blow you away. The police are not against you, folks. This is not about police officers. The police are not against you. It's these politicians that won't make the want to make a sheep out of you and offer you up on the sacrifice of their liberalism. And so she could have stopped him. But you can't see the contrast any greater. For on one hand, you got a murdering devil. You got a demon possessed coward. He kills these people, and on the other hand, you got bravery like you'll never see any greater on your, in your lifetime. When a man or a woman stands up knowing they're going to die for their faith in my Lord Jesus Christ, I got no criticism whatsoever for somebody like that. That is as real as Christianity gets. It doesn't get any more real than that. When you're willing to stand up and die for your faith in the Son of God, somebody has got to listen. Somebody's got to take note. Somebody's got to say something about that. And by the grace of God, I'm going to do it. I want them to get all the honor and respect that's due them. I don't even know their names. They list the nine people and they list their names, but I don't know which ones stood up. I don't know which ones were murdered because they were Christians. But it's just as well. I'll meet them one day. I'll meet them one day. It's like the letter I got a couple of days ago from one of the ladies that wrote into the ministry here. I read her letter and it was such a sweet letter. She said, I just lost my husband of 50 years, preacher. Please pray for me. She says, I'll meet him by the river. <laughs> I thought, my, 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 my. I'll meet him by the river. And she will. She will. He's gone right now, but that's the faith of Christ. We know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I'll see him again, she said. I say, thank God, thank God for that kind of peace and that kind of hope and that kind of grace. And so they left this world like that. And all you have now is the testimony and the witness of who they were. That's a wonderful thing. I mean, how could anything good, you say, come out of a horrible, horrible murdering devil like that? But that testimony's good. 
I don't know, did I encourage you? Did that, did, that, did that light a fire under your soul? To know that these people stood up, God bless their soul, in the face of death, and said, I'm not going to deny him. I'm not going to deny him. I'll stand up and take what's coming because I love my Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'm preaching to somebody this morning, if you like to hide behind people, you're going to have a hard time finding anybody to hide behind in that room. There's nowhere to hide there. You might as well run on. You might as well run on and find you somewhere else to hide. If all you can do is spit venom out of your mouth and criticize Christianity and Christians and you're a raving lunatic and mad all the time and you're mad at Christ and mad at his church, let me ask you a question. What has the Lord Jesus ever done to you? I know what he did for you. <laughs> Amen. You never met a friend like him. Nobody ever loved you like Jesus. That's the greatest name you ever heard in your life. You can hear my name, forget me, you forgot nothing. But ever hear his name and forget him, you forgot it all. He's the greatest of the greatest, the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the bright and morning star. He's our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of all mankind. Oh, if this monster had only known him, I don't believe he would be blowing people away. But he did. I read this morning, the latest that I've gotten from him, said he committed suicide as the law came in on him and the, and the officers armed to the teeth came after him and he realized now that no more, no more, no more sitting ducks to kill. It was time like, uh, like the two out there at Columbine when they went in there and Rachel Scott and, and Cassie Bernal. Do you remember Columbine High School? Do you remember those two? Uh, uh, Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris walked in there and had their black trench coats on and, and they were armed. I mean, they had every kind of a weapon. They showed videos where they'd been out in the woods shooting and they prepared themselves for it and they went in there and they started killing these kids and they, and they, and they, and they, and they shot Cassie Bernal and Rachel Scott because they were Christians. Murdered them right there on the spot. And then there's a photograph and I don't know if you've ever seen it or not, and it's not a pretty thing, but there's a picture taken. There's a photograph where the law went in there and photographed it where they, where they had blown their own brains out. It, uh, I think both of them did it with a rifle or something like that, and it shows their dead body lying there and the blood around them. And I thought to myself, they just blew themselves into hell. I mean, they made their statement, now they're in the pit. And they're going to be in the pit forever. You understand to go to hell, Fred, is not a joke. It's not party time. It's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And so they died and they went to hell. And these that stood for Christ are in heaven now. And that's where they're going to be forever. And glory to God. Hallelujah. Welcomed in hell and embraced by the devil. Oh, I'm sorry. You got it so messed up. Pope Francis was with us the other day. And the closing event for Pope Francis was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Philadelphia is rich in history for this nation, folks. That's where the Liberty Bell is located. That's where the First Continental Congress was located before they moved to Washington, D.C. That's where we started as a nation, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Phileo and Adelphos, it is the city of brotherly love. And so while he was there, uh, the closing event was followed in mass, and, and, the, and the archbishop called, he changed the name of Philadelphia to Francisville. <laughs> And uh, he renamed the city during the Mass at the Cathedral Basilica of St. Peter and Paul. I'm glad it didn't stick. Amen. I'm glad that they don't have the authority to change the name. I what they wonder what they'd call Knoxville if, if they came in here and changed this. Uh, but anyway, uh, he, uh, he, it was quite boring compared to his appearance in New York at St. Patrick's Cathedral in Manhattan for the evening prayer where he delivered pretty shocking words. Uh, listen carefully to this now. Stating with no shame to his flock that, quote, we need to remember that we are followers of Jesus Christ and his life, humanly speaking, ended in failure, the failure of the cross. He didn't stop with simply saying that the life of the Lord Jesus Christ ended in failure. No, no, no. He specified. He said it ended in the failure of the cross. So I thought, Lord, let me read Calvary for them. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled 
at the law I'd spurned till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. The one that wrote that believes something happened at Calvary that wasn't a failure. I don't believe the cross was a failure. No, 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 no. If I could have gotten to this man there, that murderer out there in Oregon and preached Christ and him crucified, as the apostle Paul said, he might have had an opportunity to be saved. You say, preacher, how can a cross that, that stood out there 2,000 years ago outside Jerusalem, how can that do any good for me? Oh, it can do a lot of good for you. That cross is just as alive today as it was then because there's a message that comes out from it. There's a Savior dying on it. There's a spirit that's attached to it that, my friend, is the witness of Almighty God. That Roman centurion looked up at the cross where the Lord Jesus Christ was hanging and he, he felt the earthquake. He felt the wind. He saw the anger and the hatred, but he saw the love coming out of his soul. And that centurion said, Behold, this man and surely was the son of God and that, uh, that Roman centurion had it right friend the cross at Calvary opens up the love of God like nothing else it opens up the door to heaven like no other place it gives you an opportunity to look in to the very heart of God like nothing else on this earth and was Calvary a failure was crucifixion a failure as the Pope says was the cross a failure oh no 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 what does the Bible say the Bible says in John chapter number 19 and verse number 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said it is finished and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Glory to God. Are you listening? He said on the cross while it was hanging on the tree, he said it's finished, it's done, it's accomplished, it's consummated. No more can be done. That doesn't sound to me like failure. That sounds to me like victory. In Galatians chapter number 6 and verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross, bless his holy name, of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I unto the world. The apostle Paul didn't see it as a failure. He saw something he could glory in. Because Why did he glory in it, preacher? Because it was greater than him. The cross represented somebody higher than he was. He didn't look to himself. He looked to the one on the tree in the book of Colossians chapter number 2 and the Bible says and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to his cross and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That doesn't sound to me like it's a defeat. That sound doesn't sound like failure. That sounds like victory to me. Victory in Jesus. We sing in that song. If the cross ended in failure, Mr. Pope, then where can I go for victory? That's a logical question. If the cross was was ended in failure, Mr. Pope, you tell me where I can go to get any victory. If there's no victory at Calvary, if there's no victory in my Lord Jesus Christ, where is it then? It's in my church, he'd say. I said, I'm sorry. I can't get by your pedophile priest, I'm afraid, to bring my son into your house. I'm afraid he's going to be molested before I can ever get far enough along to reach Almighty God. Amen, friends. I'm telling you right now, that place is shot through with more hell than you could ever imagine. They've got pre right. They just had everywhere. It's all over the place. It's beyond belief. But listen carefully. If the cross ended in failure, then where can I go for victory? Well, I can go to man. 
Man will give me victory. He can pump me up with dope. He can give me a psychiatrist. He can teach me how to feel good about myself. And then from that day on, I can walk on in victory. Amen? No, friend. The hospitals are full of nutcases right now. And all they've ever had done to them is what man says. Man says. Oh, by the way, have you ever had your faith in man shattered? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah. Have you really ever had your faith in man shattered? Now, listen. Please, I don't, I don't be mean. I've met some very outstanding people. I've met people that I have great respect for. You better believe it. I've met humanity in this world that I love and have respect for, and I know they love the Lord Jesus. I have people in this world that I've known in my lifetime that I have the greatest respect for, yes. But when I say man, I'm talking about man in general. The Bible said plainly, don't put your faith and trust in man. No way. Well, you say then the institutions will do the job. If I could just get the right education and think about it right, everything's going to be acquired. I'm sorry there too. That's not going to work either because they don't even agree among themselves. And I'll tell you right now, friend, there's an awful lot of stuff going on out there that is just plain old demonic. You say, well, religion will do the job. Yeah, plenty of religion, all kinds of religion, more religion than you could ever imagine, but it's not going to do it either. And so the Pope Church won't do it. So if the cross, there's no victory, then where is victory? Well, I'll tell you where it is. It's at the cross. Second Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse 19, the Bible said to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. It was at the cross at Calvary. If you want to meet God, meet him at the cross. Amen! Amen. If you want to come face to face with the Almighty, come to the cross at Calvary. He'll meet you there. Amen! And you won't meet that divine judge. You won't meet that holy Lord God Almighty. You'll meet that gracious, merciful one that gives you grace and mercy at the cross, at the cross. The precious blood of Christ was shed at the cross. Revelation 1.5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. Why was that blood shed? I ask you that question. Why was the blood of Christ shed? On the cross, on the cross, in his hands and in his feet, nailed to a tree with a crown of thorns rammed down on the top. I'm talking about big thorns. I'm talking about thorns that go into the skin and puff it out from the from the from the bone. I'm talking about blood running down his face, blood running down his arms, blood running down his feet. I'm talking about his back being laid open with the cat of nine tails. I'm talking about the sinew showing. I'm talking about the bones of his back showing. I'm talking about Somebody that gave his all for you. It was on the cross that that blood sacrifice was made. It was the covenant between God and man. There is no covenant that will save your soul apart from the covenant at the cross at Calvary. That's the only way that a man can be saved. Amen. The powers of hell were confronted and defeated at the cross. The Bible said in Colossians 2, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have they quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, I love this, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. What's that mean, preacher? That means you're guilty. That means you've been judged and found guilty. That means we deserve hell. That means I did. I worked hard to go to hell. I deserved it. But the sentence of my hell fire and damnation, the sentence passed upon all my sins. Guilty, yeah. guilty was taken and nailed to the tree yeah. and he paid for them yeah. down the cross yeah. and they don't have to be paid for. Hallelujah yeah. to God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And I'm telling you right now, some of you in this house this morning, you may have lived a raunchy, profligate, godless life that you would, you would literally never show your face in public again if it was taken and put on a screen up here for everybody to see. You ought to get up from where you are and come down here on this and get down on your face and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. I'll never have to face that. You paid for all of that sorry sin and you nailed it to the tree. Hallelujah to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And I'll never have to stand in judgment for what I used to be. 
and for what I've done. Isn't that love? Oh, that's love. You want love to find for you? You go to the cross at Calvary. There you find the true love of God. Amen. Amen. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. I'm sorry, Mr. Pope Francis. You may see it as a failure. I don't. That cross is not foolishness to me. That is the power of God. But unto us which are saved, Paul says, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. <laughs> unto the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are saved, which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. I will glory in the cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Oh, have you ever sung that song? If it wasn't for the cross, we'd be so lost. Oh, we'd be so lost. No, friend, it's not got by good deeds. It's not by catechisms. It's not by joining a church. It's not by being confirmed. It's by the blood of the cross. That we have access to the Father, and there is no other way. Bless thy holy righteous name, Lord, for letting this old piece of clay stand up and speak for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for letting this old piece of clay stand up and preach Christ and Him crucified. Oh, my, what an honor, what a privilege to even say the word. Lord, I remember where I came from. I remember the hole you found me in. And I'm so thankful this morning that you've been gracious and merciful. I commit to thee this service now. Anything that happens in it, anybody that's helped, anybody saved, anybody delivered, anybody healed, it's all been by, done by thee. I'm just a messenger. And Lord, I am so thankful. I'm so proud to be just the messenger. That's good. That's all I ever want to be, just the messenger. In thy holy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up this morning.